these are new forest ponies and they roam semi-wild here in the new forest in Hampshire. And you know, it's hard to believe there's a natural area as big as this in the overcrowded south of England and it's packed with wildlife and is so accessible. The new forest is huge, 150 square miles, and it's been here since William the Conqueror set it up as a hunting forest. And just look at this, these are exactly the same animals that old William wanted fed so he could hunt them, and there were plenty here in the forest today. The deer are fed each day during the summer. It's a rare opportunity to get close views of these normally shy animals. Watching over the herd is Sally Wood. Of course, these are all fallow, Sally, aren't they? That's correct. And a range of coats here, the traditional, you know, tan and spots, but also mm -hmm. some dark and light ones too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have four different colour coat variations, which I think makes the fallow deer a very pretty deer to observe. Um, you can see in the background there, we've got a white deer. We've also got what we call menol deer as well, the very dark coats. You don't see the spots, not so obvious. And we've also got um, one of the prettier coats is They've got cream spots, but very, very bright white spots, yeah. and they keep those spots all year round. So that animal will keep menil. its spots? Yeah, right? it will keep its spots all year round, which oh, I didn't makes it very that. distinctive, yes. The males shed their antlers in spring, and now they're growing new ones. The outer layer is called velvet, but it peels off and the bone hardens in time for the mating season. Now, I, I can speak as a bird fan, mm -hmm. so anything with feathers <laughs> takes my fancy. Uh, why deer for you? Deer for me? Well, I think it must go back to the first movie I watched, which was Bambi. I knew it. <laughs> early, early it was references. so pretty. And ever since, I've been quite passionate about deer. And so, yeah, I just think they're absolutely fantastic. Do it for me. Now, deer are a very special feature here in the forest, but their numbers do have to be controlled. You see, in the old days, there were plenty of wolves and bears to do that. But now, man has to take charge, and every winter, they are culled. But the good news is that other types of wildlife gets to flourish. And one group of animals, a particularly delicate and beautiful group, are in fact enjoying a bit of a renaissance on account of this deer management. Butterflies are now feasting on all the plants and undergrowth that would have been destroyed by the deer. For forest keeper Robert Colin Stokes, this is just what he hoped for. It's been quite an uphill uh, struggle. As you can see, the deer have been correctly managed, the ponies have been kept out. The proof's in the pudding here, Chris, as you can see. Lots and lots of plants and loads of bramble bushes. Plenty of nectar. Yep. And there's a silver wash there, look. Oh, see yeah. there on that bramble. Yeah, nice male. See how orange it is? Yeah, fantastic, isn't it? I mean, there are species that almost disappeared, aren't they? They did. During the uh, early 80s, they were uh, incredibly rare in, in the forest and in the enclosures, but now almost every bramble bush has got uh, a silver wash fertility feeding on it. What a sight. Look at that. They are pretty special. The area is teeming with butterflies. This one's aptly named the ringlet and the well-camouflaged brimstone. And this bizarre-looking specimen, the comma. It's only British butterfly with ragged wings. And can you see that white mark yeah, look on the underwing? Yeah. That's how it gets its name. It's a comma. Looks like a piece of old crumpled oak leaf. It does. There's a white admiral there, Chris. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah. For me, they are, you know, one of the real new forest specialities, as it were. And bramble, I mean, look, I always say to people, if you're into wildlife gardening, you know, have a little bit of bramble in your garden, down by the back fence or something. Loads of nectar, loads of fruit for other species, and also nothing climbs through it, good security. The other good thing to think about, Chris, when you come to the forest is uh, don't come in the middle of the day when all the butterflies have really heated up and have got going. You need to come sort of mid-morning is ideal, just as the sun has worn them through, and you'll get some lovely close views of them. What more could you yeah, ask for? Yeah, like now, look at that. Yes. There's a gatekeeper there as well, yeah. and with that white apple. And a small skipper there as well. Right, well, if you do come to the forest in July, mid-morning, you're virtually certain to enjoy a feast of butterflies. I mean, just look at that. But not all of the animals that live in the forest are quite as showy as this. Some of them, I have to say, pretty secretive. 
One of Britain's most charismatic animals, a t-shirt animal, a poster pin-up of our fauna, is the badger. But it's a creature that has a reputation for being terribly shy, very, very difficult to see in the wild, and as a consequence, many people go a lifetime without doing so. And that's a real shame, because it isn't that difficult. First of all, of course, you need to find yourself a badger set. And that's what we've got here. It's not a rabbit one, the hole is much too big. And it's not a fox earth. Fox earths normally have one or two entrances at the most, but here, behind me in this bracken, are about 20 other holes. It always pays to fully explore the set you're going to watch at in daylight first. Get the lie of the land, figure out where all of the active holes are, and also make a mental note of where all the badger's paths are that radiate out of the set. Because when you come back in the evening, you want to make a point of treading over those. You don't want to leave any scent here. And not leaving any scent is incredibly important. Badgers have got a very poor eyesight, but they've got keen herring and a very, very good sense of smell. Another tip, bring a box of matches, light the match, blow it out, see which way the smoke goes. You see, you want to be definitely downwind. You don't want them to get a whiff of you at all. And my last bit of advice, be prepared to wait, preferably against a tree to disguise your outline. And don't move, it will be worth it. It's about half past eight in the middle of summer. It's still full daylight. It's about the best time of year to watch badgers. And there it is, the first badger of the evening making a tentative appearance. Look, look, that's a female badger. You can tell it's a female because it's got a long, thin, narrow neck, quite a slim body, and a long, narrow tail as well. The boars are far more chunky. And look, there's another one, there's another one. I've got to try and control my excitement and not speak too loudly. A set like this might have as many as 15 badgers living together. There are two there having a bit of a scrap. One of them, I think, is a male, a boar badger, and the other one a cub. But, I mean, they're so close, it's fantastic. One badger has come round the side and could soon be downwind of us. I'm sure she smelt us. And look at that, ladies and gentlemen. That's what happens when a badger gets your scent. And in an ideal world, you don't want that. I think scarpered will be the technical phrase. All of the badgers have left the set area now, and it's important for you to wait for them to go back down their holes or to move off. Otherwise, you'll disturb them leaving and spoil everything for next time. So leave as quietly as I can. <laughs> 